Do not make my coming here this afternoon in vain. In the name of Jesus. Pray like that. Lord Jesus, don't make, don't Lord make my coming here this afternoon in vain. In the name of Jesus. Not a wasted exercise. A waste of time. I shall not come here in vain. Open your mouth and pray. You are not really praying. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Everlasting Father, we thank you once again because you are faithful. We appreciate you because you are the one that actually wed the first couple together in the Garden of Eden. And we look up to you for these young ones that you take up their life in the name of Jesus. Father, plan their life for them and let your name be glorified. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Shall we sit down? This morning, by the God, this afternoon, by the grace of God, we are going to discuss ID godly spouse. I did godly spouse, exigencies of our times, and the mind of God. Please try to get your jota ready because uh, we try to jot some things down. Later, the pastor will introduce to you the book. Everything I'm going to teach you is from this book. They will give it to you. But I have a very small copies. I didn't know I was going to be plenty like this. So try and jot some things down. Thereafter, they'll pass the book around. You can pick a copy. Amen. I did godly spouse. I did godly, godly spouse. Exigencies of a... Uh, of a time situation and the mind of God. Let's open our Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Open your Bible to Genesis chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all, all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an herb meat for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken for man, made he a man and woman, and brought her unto... I read 22 again. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was uh, taken out of man. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and uh, shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. I want to read from verse 3. Matthew 19 from verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he, we them, we made them in the beginning, made them male and female? And is and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more to him, but one flesh. What therefore uh, God has joined together, let no man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of a divorcement, and to put her away? He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffer you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I said, therefore, unto you, whosoever 
shall put away his wife except for fornication, and shall marry another commit, at committed adultery, and whoso marry her which is a put away, do commit adultery. His disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot take, cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some Enoch which were so born of uh, their mother's womb. And there are, so, uh, there are some Enoch which are made Enoch of a man. And there be Enoch which have made themselves Enoch for the kingdom of heaven. Sake that in able to receive it, and that able to receive it, let him receive it. Praise the Lord. You see, we are discussing today, as I've told you before, uh, ideally godly uh, spouse, good wife, good husband. The time situation we are in now, and my, the mind of God. I'm sure that uh, those of us that are here today, we want to please God in our marital life. We want God to be glorified. And therefore, that is why we are here. Otherwise, there are so many tactics that people of the world are using today. We have so many things people are using. There's one we call Romeo and Juliet. It's a system of matching the couple together. We have a specialized organized organization connecting people together now. We have them. We have a computerized matching system. We have internet connection, we have horoscope matching, and other ritualistic methods. All these systems are the what people of the world are using now for matchmaking, to make it easier. But my brother and my sisters, may I tell you, the first marriage was organized by God himself. From what we have just read now, God created only one Adam, isn't it? Only one Adam. And Adam was busy working for the Lord. Adam never requested for a partner. He never. But while God was watching Adam, the, level, the work he was doing, and his commitment, and, and he does things, God now is purely an idea of God. God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet. Not help mate. No. There are two different things. F mate and F mate are not the same thing. God said, I will make a F meet for him. It was purely the idea of God. And God the one that made it. And God never asked Adam, Do you want a woman? Do you want a man? No. God now molded, he took the bone of the rib of that Adam. Why Adam was a cause to sleep. And he took that bone. There are bone elsewhere, but he took from the rib of that uh, man and made a woman. When God removed that uh, bone from the side of that man, that man was no longer complete. Because one bone had been taken. And through that bone now, God now made a woman. And when God was making it, Adam was not peeping. He was not peeping what God was making. I am sure that there may be Adam had been anesthetized and had been, had been put under, under sleep. By the time he woke up, he saw God now bringing the woman onto Adam. Ad, the woman never walked onto Adam and said, don't I look like you? He didn't. She didn't. It was God who brought that woman onto Adam. I want to notice all these uh, points in the Bible, but they are very important to our marital life. After God brought that woman onto Adam, Adam looked at her, that this woman does not have tail like monkey. He resembled me. Therefore, she shall be called a woman. Not because she was yellow. Not because she was fat. Not because she was tall. Not because she was uh, anyhow. But because she looks like me, this one should be called a woman. And that was how the first marriage was conducted. Beloved, because of our time, I would not like to go into deep details. Because the marriage you are looking at in Genesis chapter 2, is different from the marriage you are now seeing in Genesis chapter 3. Things has happened and things has changed. 
within that uh, few uh, short period. Therefore, please listen attentively. Very important for us today. Impatience and lack of godly fear are brought onto hardship onto many homes today. Parents, because of present situation, abandon their responsibility to uh, time dictates and suggestions on TV. And of course, many are couple too, having no, I mean, they don't have patience to wait upon the Lord. And because of that, now they rush into things. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 to 19, the Bible says, For I testify unto every man that heard the word of God and this prophecy. If any man should have to read or learn from it, such person's name will be taken out of the book of life. What am I telling you today? I want to tell you the, the word of God is unique. If you pass, bypass the word of God and go and do things on your own way, of course, you are going to face the consequence of your choice eventually in life. And that is why it's good to depend upon the manufacturer to know the details of when uh, to get through to the product you are facing. And the Bible told us clearly that the word of God must not be added unto. In the Bible where we have just read now, we saw one, uh, three, I mean five things. Number one, we saw one man, one woman. Only one. One man, one woman. And of course, Today, we are witnessing a lot of uh, uh, pollution and wrong teaching that people are now giving uh, to the youth like us. They said one man and a woman at a time. That is not Bible. They had at a time to read. In other words, you can marry as many times you want to marry, but only one woman and one man at a time. That is a wrong teaching. It's not biblical. Number two, they told us that monogamy is only for bishops or for workers. No. The Bible enjoined us that one man and one woman for a lifetime. That's what the Bible says. Number three, that God is too kind to punish extramarital affairs. These are wrong teaching. Whoever, whoever you hear that one, never you follow it. Number four, that Jesus and God has permitted divorce and remarry. It has never happened like that in the Bible. From where I read you to you just now. That trial marriage could be allowed. And separation is permissible. And in cases, it is wrong teaching. All this teaching, whatever you are, uh, you hear it, you should run away from it. For the Bible says, "Forever, O Lord, that word is uh, settled in heaven." We should not utter the word of God, beloved. Many young believers today, they thought that because we have many women and many young ladies and many uh, young boys in the church. It makes it easier. Never. It's not make it, it make it easy at all. There is a particular uh, a lady that God has attached to your life because marriage and destiny they are in this, I mean, in the inseparable. A better marriage will lead to a better destiny. Likewise, a better destiny will lead to a uh, better marriage. What am I saying? Marriage and destiny they go together. If you run into wrong marriage. You may not likely achieve your destiny in life because marriage and destiny they go together and that is why you must be very careful to know how you are going to lay the foundation of your marriage if you lay it upon the lord of course you will not regret ever going to it but when you allow all those tactics that i told you now when the consequence comes you have no one to blame but yourself you see there are many young ladies and young men in the church now does not make it easier you see, it's good to trust the Lord. For because you cannot marry every, every lady you see in the church. You cannot marry every man that you see in the church. There's a particular man or a particular lady. God has attached to your life. And when you don't discover that one, you marry a wrong round. Of course, there are consequences for such a one. That is why it's good to pray and to pray through. As children of God, to see the man of God before we go into it. You see, as a Christian... There are some areas of marriage we must not venture into. Number one, a Christian must not try to date an unbeliever. Can you hear me very well? A Christian must not try to date an unbeliever. The Bible forbids any form of a, a serious friendship between Christian and non-Christian of the opposite set. You see, the Bible warns us. We can see that in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 to 4. And of course, in Second Corinthians chapter, chapter 6, verse 14 to 18. You see, you, you cannot convert anybody. 
You have no power to make anybody a Christian. And that is why it is the work of Holy, Holy Spirit. Don't try to date an unbeliever. Don't go into serious relationship with anybody that's not a Christian. It's against God's standard. You must not try to do it. We need to pray and ask God. Pray and ask God for his uh, choice for your life before you ever venture into it. And God will never choose what, you are, what, what he has worked against. He will never choose an unbeliever unto you. Well, no, never. You see, praying and asking God to do what his word already forbid is wrong and amount to asking for his permissive will. Do you know what I'm saying now? When God has uh, told you never to go into marriage with unbeliever, and you are now asking, oh Lord, I want to marry this one. Please God, let it be possible. You are looking for a permissive will of God, and it will never happen. You see, there are common temptation to free you, you can, you can convert anybody. You have no power to get anybody converted at all. You can't. Because you are, you are, you are like somebody who is standing on a chair. You want to drag somebody on the floor up. It's not possible. Somebody on the floor can bring you down easily. That's why you must not venture into an unbeliever. Who is unbeliever? Who do we call unbeliever? Number one. Who are the unbeliever? Because when I say unbeliever now, you thought only those who are outside. You thought about the Muslim. You thought about the pagan. No. There are some unbeliever inside the church also. Who are in the church like you? Who are the number one? The prosperous man who is not born again. A prosperous one, he has money, but is not born again. Number two, that beautiful lady, well educated, who met all your entire physical and structural requirements, but not Christ like. Not Christ like. Number three, who is an unbeliever? The well behaved person who has not given his life to Jesus. He has good behavior. He has good character. But like, like Jesus in such a life. Who is some believer? <clears throat> the believer who is not a new creation. You can see him in the church, but it's never a new creation. He has not tasted Christ in his life, but he knows how to pretend. The Pentecostal who speak in tongue, but lack divine love uh, of God. And number seven, the convert, that convert who is not free from sin, that new convert who is yet to free from sin, who is some believer, that backslider who is no more in Christ, who though it may be in the choir, may be in the ushering team, may be in the church worker anywhere in the church, it could possibly be a minister, but not converted. A young lady or boy, though of your tribe or your language, but lack the experience of Calvary. It's unbeliever. Who is unbeliever? Number 10. Somebody who value, whose value are not heavenly bound, but mind only this world. All the category of people that, I, that I'm telling you now, you can find them in the church. And that is why when you want to marry, you need to pray and God intervention. You see, even though prayer is very important, but as a Christian, you must not approach God with idol in your heart. With idol in your heart. Some people will say, oh, I want to marry. And I have about two or three sisters on her now. God, who do I choose? Is it Alice? Is it Margaret? Is it Ingozi? In other words, you are now putting God to make a choice within that three. That idea is wrong. You don't come to God with an idol in your heart. When you want to pray for choice in marriage, you allow your mind to get open and pray that God should choose the one that will match your future unto you. This looks difficult to a lot of people, but I tell you, it's very possible and very real. God is still choosing for people, and you must not uh, put God at the tight corner and say, God, we will see that one in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 14, verse 2 to 12. You must not uh, choose for God. Uh, number three, no marry with anyone that is near of kin. That is, you must not marry your relation. I've said three things now. Don't marry unbeliever. Don't marry, uh, don't have an idol in your heart. And number three, you must not marry your relatives. You see, I despise. How do I get I despise? 
how do I get the one that God has chosen for me? Your choice determines who you become. Your choice will determine what you become. I told you that marriage and destiny, they go together. The other time I came here, I told you the story of a man who was 70 years old. And he came to me after he has wasted his life. And he told me one day, he said that, Daddy, I need your intervention. I remember when I was about to get married and I was to travel to UK. The parent came and the parent said, you must marry before you travel. And the man said, while he was waiting for that, the lady wanted to marry. Four days to their wedding. The lady said, it's no longer interesting. Interesting in that, in that issue. And because he wants to travel, the mother has to go to the village and brought a lady for that man to marry, and the man got married. He traveled abroad, he came back for more than 30 years. No issue. When he came back, the mother said, let me give you another lady. They went to the village, brought another second one. When they brought the second one, the same day, the two of them got pregnant. And they delivered the same period. And the man had two wives. And the man said, that is how he started the journey of his life. And the unfortunate thing is, the man became a director in the ministry. And he retired as a director with nothing. He was telling me the pathetic story that he achieved nothing in life. And when he was retiring, they packed all his load in a container. He has no house. He has no car. Although he has children now, but a wasted destiny. Eventually, he was living in the bus quarter of uh, his uh, junior brother. He said one day, he went to a particular program. And while he was coming, and while he was coming, he met the mother at the door of the house. And the mother said, welcome, my son. Did your pastor tell you who is behind your problem? He said, no, my man, they have not told me. He said, you have not told me. Let me tell you, I am behind your problem. You see, what I want to bring out of this issue is that uh, the man had a wasted destiny. He achieved nothing in life because of marital program that had been programmed into his life. The mother now confessed that uh, if you ask, if you watch the way those two wives fought, wife, uh, used to fight you, all of us, we gang together because we belong to the same coven. You understand? That is why, you see, it's good to plan your marriage on your own. And pray until you pray through. If you don't pray through, there are some issues you may not understand now that will crop up in future. I told you your choice determines who you become. Who you are does not determine your choice in life. Everybody has access to choices in life. For instance, there are 24 hours in a day. Give it to everyone. Like now you choose to be air. Some are somewhere else, isn't it? So the way you spend your time belongs to you. And therefore, even the issue of marriage, the choices you make depend upon you. Life is a choice. The way you spend your time is your choice. Your choice in marriage determines who you become. Some prefer facial outlook rather than content inside. Some prefer, oh, a facial outlook rather than content inside. Some brother will say, oh, I need a tall lady. I need a yellow lady. I need a black one. I need the fat one. You see, these are choices. But may I tell you, all these things that you are making as a priority, it has nothing to do with your marital life. Because all those things can change. Is that right? But when you want to do that, look at the content. The content inside the person. Is the person really born again? Do you have, the, the, the person has Christ in his life or alive? Very, very important. The Bible told us in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 to 30, it says, Favor is, I mean, is a deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a man that fear the Lord, she shall be praised. A man that fear the Lord shall be praised. It's good to make sure that the content that is inside the person tally with what you want in life. We make our choices, and our choices make us. Some make their choices by word, number one, by what people will say, or people say. They will say, oh, 
If I marry this person now, what would they say? What would my parents say? What would my friends say? What would they say in my village? So some people are making their choices by what people say or what people will say. This is our own idea. Number two, some make their choices by tradition. They say, oh, in our village, we must not marry outside. We must marry from our village. Whether she is born again or not born again, you must go to village during Christmas and go and look for wife. By tradition, all these ones are wrong. Number three, by pressure, within and without. You see, a time is coming in your life where you're going to face pressure. If you don't marry at the age, you're supposed to get married. Pressure will come from parents. It will come from uh, your friends. It will come from a uh, pressure, even within yourself also. You begin to imagine yourself getting married, and you have not done so. And the pressure within can push you. And because of that, you can fall into a wrong choice. Number four, by God guidance. These are four key things that may likely portray your choice in life. But be warned, for you will live with the consequence of the decision of choice you make in life. Whatever you have chosen, you are going to live with it for life. That is why if you allow the pressure of outside or pressure within to push you, you are going to see the consequence eventually or the pressure of your parents or the pressure of the poor side. You allow that one to, to push into marriage. You are going to live because of, because of it. You see, the Bible looks at marriage not as a social contract that may be broken at will, but the Bible calls it the mystery. It is a mystery. You see, designed to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. Don't forget that the only legacy that is remained in the Garden of Eden is marriage. Everything has been destroyed. That is, what you saw in chapter 2 is not the marriage you saw in chapter 3. Things have changed because of the sin of that woman. Things have changed drastically. And that is why you need to be very, very careful. Allow God to design your life for you. Please note the following thing. Number one, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, the Bible says, say, Whosoever findeth a wife, findeth the good uh, thing, favor of God. Number two, God expects every Christian, listen very carefully, God expects every Christian to go into marriage with their eyes open. Brothers, look up here. And sisters, look up here. You see, God will not force you to marry anybody. He will never. Therefore, sometimes you must open your eyes because I've counseled a lot of people, especially those who are older. The older people, they believe that uh, as I have prayed, after I have prayed now, I'll just be going. One day God will just bring a lady and say, sit down on the slab. That's a wife. No, it will not work that way. You see, God does not work that way. And that is why God expects us that we must go into marriage with your two eyes open. Number three, he will never force you anybody on you. God will never do that. You will have to do the looking and choosing yourself. But the Lord will guide and direct your path. The Lord will guide and direct your path. To speak to the person you choose, I mean, your choice about marriage and to wait on the Lord for guidance regarding who to marry are not contradictory. Rather, they are complementary. And be your... Uh, and be ye not conformed to this world, as we see in Romans chapter 12, where we read just now. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the knee of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When a Christian is fully surrendered to God, he will prove what is that good will of God. It is right to say that you have faith that you will provide a suitable wife or husband for yourself. But remember... Faith without work is dead. You must put your faith to work by intelligently looking for a partner whom God has chosen for you as ordained for your life. A perfect guidance of how to seek wife. By the Lord, you can see that on Genesis chapter 24. When Abraham said uh, he want a wife for Isaac and he sent the servant to go back to where he came from. And the servant, when he was going, he prayed. And God actually manifests himself the way the man has prayed. He said, God, as I'm going now, I've never been to this city before. And anybody I talk to, 
let it be this and that. And of course, when the man got to that well, he spoke the way he has told God. And the thing happened the same way, straightforward like that. You can do the same thing. Want to get married? Pray and say, God, how will I know your choice in marriage? If this lady is my wife, if this man is my husband, let this and this and this and this happen. And of course, God is very faithful. Whatever you say with God, God, God's will, it will happen. But majority of all, we thought that a God does not understand. God does not know that I am educated. God does not know that I'm a university graduate. God does not know that I need a tall lady. God does not know that I need an educated person. You see, God is aware of all these ones. When you trust God with all your heart, the Lord will choose the right person unto you. Some result into mechanical method of knowing the will of God by resulting into opening the Bible. Some will say, oh, look at me. I want to, God is talking to me now. God, as I open my Bible now, let me open to the place where you are talking to me. Bam! You open the Bible. Maybe you open to Job chapter, Job chapter 7 now. When you see plenty of course, you say, no, no, God, I'm making a mistake. You see, it is this a mechanical form. God does not talk in that way. I will tell you further as we go, well, how, to make, how to get choice in marriage. You see, uh, many young men pray for wife as if they are praying for a job. She becomes an object, a target, an achievement. When they finally get an idea, is that they're realizing how they're going to talk and jack themselves up? What am I saying? Some brothers, after they have prayed and they want to talk to the lady, they say, ah, God, as I'm going now, I, 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 this I'm going to say to you, I say, good morning, ma'am. God they said that she come and marry you. They begin to rehearse it in their house before they go out as if they are going to for an interview. There are four basic steps to know the will of God. What are basic, basic steps? I told you, you can see that in Psalm 37, verse 3 to 7. The basic way of knowing the will of God. Psalm 37, verse 3 to 7. Number one, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord. That verse 3. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. What are we saying? We look unto him as our source of supply. Focus your attention upon the Lord alone. Don't have any alternative than God. Number two, delight thyself in the Lord. Delight thyself in the Lord. That is, make him the center of your life and our joy. Let God be everything unto your life. In other words, don't withdraw anything. From the hand of God, let it be free by submitting your life unto God completely. Number three, commit thy way unto the Lord. Commit the way, your way, unto the Lord. We can see that one in verse five. That is, when we commit all to him, we take off our hand. You see, you remove your hand. All the worry, all the anxiety, they are taken from your life. I know of a lady who was 38 years, and she came for marriage counseling, she showed dejected and looked like a woman of a 60 because she was frustrated. The way she was talking, you can see the frustration in her because the worry and anxiety has taken hold of her. And I know of a young lady too, which is about 38 or 40. And when you see her, she looked like an 18, lady, 18 years old because she removed her own hand. From those worry and anxiety, he casted everything unto the Lord and trusted God. Number four, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. You can hear that in verse seven. We do not need to fret and try to work out how the Lord will speak to us. Or open the, uh, or you open the door for system manipulation. You see, God will always speak to you in the way you will recognize. That is, the way God talks to you. In every other matter. In the same way God will speak to you. Do you understand what I'm saying now? The way God talks to you in every other matter. In the same way. In the same simple way. The Lord will speak to you in the area of marriage. You see, God speaks two different ways. Number one, God can talk to you through his word. Number two, God can talk to you through the inner voice of the Holy Spirit. Inner voice of the Holy Spirit. Number three, direct revelation. That is by vision or dream or revelation. 
Uh, at the same time, God can still talk to you through a giving special love unto the person. And number five, through a still small voice of your conscience. And number six, through a counsel of mature uh, Christian leaders. You see, that, just take note of those ones. I will explain later. Maybe when we ask the question. I will explain further on all those ways, six ways. God speak unto, unto people. But may I warn you, of all those six ways, the one that is most dangerous is by revelation, by dream or vision. It looks more very, very dangerous because your vision, your dream, your revelation come through three different ways. And if you are not careful, Satan can hijack what you wanted to do through those areas. You see, very important, boss and girls should not date. I told you before, you should not date again for friendship at all. You can marry, you can't, you can't marry out of sympathy. That is, don't marry out of sympathy. You can't marry somebody because he has only one eyes or he has a bad leg. Don't say, let me just help this one, marry her. Because he has two, he has only one leg. Don't marry out of sympathy. Because if you marry out of sympathy, by the time you get the person get to your house, he will not behave the way you thought he would be behaving. Number three, you, you avoid better than nothing. Avoid better than nothing. Choice to marry. Don't say that, well, I've waited for about three years now. I don't want this month to go. You just grab and say, well, you're going to marry whether you like it or not. That is better than nothing. Better than nothing, marriage. Don't go into it. Marriage on the advice of friends or relative needs God confirmation. That is a friend or a pastor or a leader is causing you to go into marriage. Please go and pray until God talks to you. Avoid consultation with a false prophet. Try to avoid that. Don't go and meet false for, for, for prophets. They should pray for you. No. If God has not spoken to you, never believe on that. Identification of the person, the work that he do, the friend that he keep, all those ones, they are matter to your our future. Very, very important. What are the steps to take now? On now? Marriage always starts in the private, and therefore when God has spoken to you, you must go and see the marriage committee of your church or go and see your pastor or your leader. Don't go to the person directly. That's the order. Number two, under no circumstances, should you go directly to such a one in any church you belong to. Don't do that. A thorough investigation will be made, uh, will be carried out by the pastor or by the leader to see whether those things are actually true. And number four, when you are true with the marriage committee, they're going to do uh, some carry, we carry out some tests for you. By the time we get to question and answer, I would go throw more light into that aspect of a, a medical test to confirm uh, all those things. And of course, a time of a caution will be declared. During which the caution will be declared. During which a fit could be made to either of the parents. It is a period of to interact intimately with the purpose of confirming God's will for their life. Otherwise, it is not too late. What am I saying? A caution period is not, it's not, it's just a period to interact closely, to match the revelation God has told you with what you are now seeing. Caution is not marriage. If what you have seen is wrong, you are free to pull out before you get married. If you go into it, the moment you are married, you are married for life. I told the story of a, I mean, a Ventani couple that came to us some time ago. They said they want to get married. During their courtship, they fought. When they fought now, they brought back the case. When they brought the case to us like that, I just look at them and say, you, the two of you cannot marry. Go and separate. They went away. They thought I was joking. They went away. After three months, they came back. They said, Daddy, we have resolved. We want to get married. We have printed our tag, our card. I said, okay, go ahead. And they submitted their card, and they did wedding for them. But may I tell you, Right from the day, first day of their wedding, they never, till today, they have separated. Because they are not men for themselves. What am I saying? Even during the courtship, I can tell you so many stories about the, that issue. You will discover, doing your courtship together now, that whether you, the relationship you saw, it was a mistake or it could be confirmed what you have seen. It is not too late to separate yourself uh, during your courtship. And of course, Dowry must be paid. Parental consent must be obtained. Parental consent must be obtained. Or obtained. Don't elope with any man. Don't elope with any lady. 
Don't run away with any person. Make sure that you pay the dowry before you do that and before you uh, carry her to your house. And of course, if you want to marry in the church, very important, there will be filing of entry at the marriage registry. Very important to do that before you can now carry, carry out ministerial blessing in the church. God bless you in Jesus' name. Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads. I know you have plenty of questions to ask. And I will, by the grace of God, I'm going to answer your question. Close your eyes and say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to fall into wrong hands. Please plan my life for me. Pray for yourself like that. Lord Jesus, I don't want to fall into wrong hands. Plan my life for me. Pray like that in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. You are not praying. Rest up. Rest up on your feet. You are not really praying. Your prayer is too cold. Stand up. I'm still waiting for you. Stand up upon your feet. Everybody stand up. I want us to raise up your two hands. I am going to pray, Lord Jesus... You are not praying. Lord Jesus, don't allow me to marry my enemy. In the name of Jesus, pray like that. Open your mouth and pray, Lord Jesus. I don't want to fall into round hand. Don't allow me to marry my enemy in the name of Jesus. Father, help me. Father, help me. Father, help me. I don't want to marry my enemy. I don't want to go to the wrong house. Father, help me now in the name of Jesus. Cry upon the Lord. Pray for yourself. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you once again this afternoon. Father, I pray for this, your children, that, Lord, they will not fall into wrong hand in the mighty name of Jesus. And those who have been planning secretly without you, O God, Father, I pray, reprogram their life for them in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, the grace of God to wait upon you, Father, bestow upon them in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I pray, God, Lord, that every vision, every revelation that's against your will in their life will never stand in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for the answer prayer. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. God bless you.